Okay. I would like to ask you to take your seats. We will be starting in a minute. Uh, I just have a few things to remind you. Uh, today you can sign up and vote for the lightning talks. The table is right outside of uh, this room. Also, if you want, you can tweet, you can write a blog, whatever. Just if you feel like it, use the hashtag DefConfCZ or Define Future. Uh, please, when you are coming through the rooms, just close the door very gently, don't smash them, and respect the full sign. So that will be all from my side. And now, please warmly welcome Honza Horak. Let's see whether mic works. How, how, how are you guys in the back? Great. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, it's great to see quite a lot of guys. Well, maybe a little less than previous uh, talk, but still great for another talk about containers. I still wonder that you are still not you know, fed up with containers yet. Um, so what this talk will be about? Uh, you already heard about how to use Docker for testing applications, how to build Docker, what tools to use, what's the history of the containers, all, all that you already know. And I think some of you might already try to write your Docker files and eventually, maybe in a few weeks, to run them in some platform as a service like OpenShift. And this is what well, what this talk will be about, to help you with this, this particular task. So I'm Honza Horak, I'm working in Red Hat, um, and why I'm talking about this topic is exactly because this was our task during the last year. We had a couple of packages, RPM packages. Well, it was actually a set of software collections, and it included quite nice set of development tools in quite recent versions. And we wanted to give those nice set of packages into containers. And what was more important, these containers were supposed to run nicely in OpenShift or generally platform as a service. It can be even something different. But on the other hand, there were supposed to work nicely on some usual machine as well. And it turned to be kind of challenging. So this talk is like set of things that we learned during the, the way, and I would like to share with you because it's not necessary to fail again the same way as we, as we did, right? <laughs> so if you will remember some of the tips, I, I'm sure that you will fail less than us. Uh, so the talk will cover several parts or several topics. First, some general stuff. Then uh, we will take a look how to create a database container. Then we will take a look how to create a Python container uh, as a, an example of um, application runtime container that will be used for building your applications. Then I will say some uh, few tips how to build containers based on software collections because it's not always that easy. And we will also look what nice containers are out there already. This talk won't cover some basic stuff about how to run containers, how to, um, or, uh, what the containers are about, some technical stuff below. It was probably already done or will be done by some other talks, so uh, I think uh, you will probably find this information in other talks. So, and yeah, this is also not about OpenShift itself. Um, I won't show you any examples uh, running the containers in OpenShift, but you are also able to see this, these examples in, uh, in other talks, um, yeah. So, I said this was not about, this is not about basics, but still some very, very basics about containers are mentioned. This is how I imagine containers, if I hear the word containers. I'm not sure if you imagine something like this, like, like similar. Uh, and I just recently realized that it's kind of a 
good. Um, well, th there are some similar things uh, between Linux containers and this kind of containers because uh, when we want to be ecologic, right, we put the right stuff into the right container. And we put only one kind of stuff into a container. So it means we kind of use the, these containers as one purpose things, like microservices are supposed to be designed. So that's, that's the first thing um, that we should care about what, is, what the content is inside, inside. And also that we use these services as microservices, like the applications in containers are microservices. Well, this, these applications, if we run the same application on virtual machine, the usual way, it can be also a microservice, right? But what's uh, really nice about containers is performance, because we don't have this uh, these, uh, level or layer of another kernel and uh, the hypervisor running. So it's much, much more efficient. But on the other hand, you already heard it several times, I'm sure. Uh, there is some security risk because since we don't have this, this another layer here, um, it's theoretically possible to influence the host system or other containers if we found some issue in the kernel. Um, yeah, I won't talk about details. I'm not the right person for it. Um, but this is, this is really necessary to keep in mind if you are developing the containers. Yeah, this is one of the tweets from yesterday, which proves that it really matters what is inside. And if, that is, uh, well, if there is only one thing that you will remember from this talk, so please remember that it really matters that the content, what, what, what is the content inside the container. And this is one of the first tips I, I give you. Look for the content that you really trust. Uh, when you are putting something into the container, it's also, uh, if, even if you know what it is, it should be something you really trust. So if we speak about RPMs, you should be like um, sure that these RPMs are coming from reliable source, they are signed, you should check it. Uh, how we can build a container? This is a very, very, um, well, the, the, the easiest way how we can uh, build the container is this, like pull the image after starting the container, running a container, and then running Docker commit, which creates a Docker image. Well, yeah, it, it works, but don't do this. Uh, if you want to create Docker images, or container images in another, another formats, use some recipes and reproducible builds because the way, uh, the, the example, what was, um, well, this example isn't very reproducible. So use reproducible builds. In the Docker world, this is uh, what Docker files are uh, served for, or this is what Docker files are for. So, this example shows the same what um, the previous example was about, creating some file with some nice greeting, and we build it using the Docker build. Nice. So let's move into some more interesting stuff. Uh, Postgres is here used as an example of the database. Uh, we want to put it into container, but you can imagine any other database because uh, it would probably work the same way. So when we want to create a Docker image and we want to like deliver it to someone, we start with the Docker file again. We start from some nice base image, which in this case might be RHEL 7, and we install RPM. Well, quite easy so far. And again, Docker build. And we see that yeah, the yum is running. There are some layers uh, created for every command. And yeah, the build is successful. 
But what is the problem here uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the example is that yum creates some cache inside the container and we don't want to have these caches like distributed to customers or users, right? So we need to um, take, about, take care about the container size in this sense as well, but generally we try to create the containers as small as possible. So in this case, what we can do is to use some uh, options for the yum command and run yum clean all in the end. And question for you, why is this yum clean all used uh, with the at at not as a separate run command? Anybody knows? Right. Uh, every command uh, creates, well, the run command creates another layer. So if we did it in a separate run command, we wouldn't make the image smaller, but even a bit bigger. Uh, so this is, this is the right way to do it. Another thing is when we try to build this, this Docker file again, we will see a bit different output because the Docker is working by default with caching mechanism. So the yum that already passed before, the yum command, will be used again because Docker thinks, well, the command is the same, so the output will be the same. But it doesn't know that there was a security update in the Postgres image yesterday, right? So you, what, what, what could happen is that you want to update your container, you build the same Docker file again after the security update of Postgres is out, but in the container there still will be the old stuff. This is because of the cache. So easy fix, Tomáš was speaking about it yesterday, using no cache true is one of the options. Tomáš was mentioning, well, more options how to avoid caching. So please be aware that this is uh, something you should just keep in mind. And of course there are some services for it. Uh, you can use some uh, tools like OpenShift build service uh, and some, something more about it. Well, I hope it was mentioned in Tomáš's presentation. I'm not sure now because that was what I supposed. <laughs> uh, but <laughs> so probably you will have to um, find more about this service. It's like an implementation that should help you to build uh, Docker, um, Docker images um, in a correct way. Okay. Do you think it's, it's all? Uh, are we ready already? Because we have like Postgres in container, right? So we should be almost ready. Well, but we are not uh, because <coughs> um, yeah, there, there are simply a couple of, quest uh, couple of things that we need to do. One thing uh, is related to security. So this is a uh, yeah, try, try of try for a joke for you. Uh, so this is a question uh, for you. Anybody knows what is small, green, and very, very dangerous? So it's, it's a frog with root access. Uh, and uh, why, I <coughs> why I'm saying, saying it here, it's, it's related to the first uh, slide for the first um, box slide when I was speaking about uh, possibility to break through kernel to host system or uh, and other um, containers. Uh, if you are root in the container, it's not very safe still. Well, there are username spaces now in Docker since yesterday, but still it's better to not be root inside the container. So this is quite easy fix. You change the user inside the Docker file. And well, the Postgres is already ready for, uh, usually databases are usually ready for running as non-user routes, uh, non-root non users. So it, that works pretty much, uh, pretty much well. There are also other, um, other environment variables set. And this is done because, yeah, this is just a tip summarized to, in order to memory. And <laughs> yeah, that that uh, that makes the uh, the frog not not to be that uh, that danger. Okay. Uh, 
about the environment variables, uh, that was the preparation for this two lines. We don't want to have just the Postgres inside the Docker or image. We want the, the Postgres to be the microservice. So once user <coughs> downloads the image and runs the container with the Postgres, he wants to run the Postgres, right? So we want to uh, make this happen inside the container, or inside the Docker file, which is done by the CMD um, command or yeah, command, uh, and it runs some script, which is not in the uh, Postgres RPM. We need to add it into the container. It's some arbitrary script, and I will show you how it looks right after <laughs> another trip that we should do the microservices, as I said. And this script looks like this. It's a database uh, that needs to have some data directory prepared. Like Postgres needs to have some directory prepared for, for running correctly. This is uh, done by initdb command. So when we run the container, the initdb command it pre pre prepares the directory with the data. This script also creates some configuration options to listen on all, um, on all uh, devices and Finally, there is exec Postgres. Yeah. And why is exec here? Well, it's a good practice that we found during the way that in order to pass uh, signals properly to the, um, to the process, it's better than forking from the bash. So another thing for you, if you want to well, if you are ready with the preparation of the container process, use exec instead of just command which would fork. Okay, and we are ready again to build. And we can run it. Uh, the minus P option, I think you already saw it in some other presentation. It maps the ports inside the container to outside. So to to port on the host. And we also named the uh, container with some shorter name than the long hash. When we want to connect to the uh, running Postgres container, we need to know the IP address, which we can do like this. And we already see that the Postgres is asking us for the password. So we are almost there except that we don't know what the password is, right? Or anybody knows? <laughs> no, anybody, uh, nobody can know because there is no default password and it's really by design. Uh, please don't use default passwords because users are lazy. They won't change the default passwords. Uh, we can rather use something like this. Uh, we can <clears throat> configure the PGHBA, which is the like configuration for accessing the database. And uh, this part is, again, part of the starting script. It starts the container locally, uh, starts the Postgres locally, like the, the database itself, but without uh, being able to connect from outside. It changes the password for the admin user, which is called Postgres in PostgreSQL, and it changes, its, <coughs> changes the password based on the environment variable. And it stops the process in order to start it properly again. Now we are able to set the password because we know already that what the password is. Uh, and I see right now that there is a small mistake. We should have uh, minus E option here to specify the environment variables. It will be in some uh, further examples. Uh, yeah, this is, this is missing here. So yeah, you, you see that it, it works. Uh, okay, how to configure the database? We already saw one option to configure the default password for admin. We can probably do more. For example, setting max connections to the database. And it's done quite in a similar way. 
We use the environment variable here and write it into the configuration file. That's what we do. And we can run the command like this. Setting a lot of uh, environment variables. Here you see what I meant by the admin password environment variable before. And you see that we also can pass some uh, variables that specify which database to create initially, what password to use uh, for a regular user called uh, Guestbook here. And this is actually the way how, how we configure uh, the containers for OpenShift because if you did something different like bind mounting a file with configuration into the, uh, into the container, it wouldn't scale much in the Kubernetes. That was, that was one thing which, what, which we really talked about a lot with OpenShift guys and this is the way which we chose uh, in the end. So for Kubernetes, it's much, much better to configure the services using environment variables instead of uh, the bind mounting. And since we don't want to have like different user experience in OpenShift and outside of the OpenShift, we also decided to support only common options, which is kind of weird, so we can ask what if I can change some another option, right? It's an obvious question. So the answer right now is, if you want to do something special with the container, which is already prepared for some general use case, you should create your own thin layer on top of it because Docker, as you know, works in layers. So you will use like a good general, but only general image as a base and use I'll create a thin layer on top of it. One thing I already um, so, um, well, you already saw, but I didn't talk about it is mounting, bind mounting the data directory for database um, because uh, you don't want to lose data once uh, the container stops or breaks, whatever. You know, kettle, it's not bad. So it can just happen that the container crashes and you want to have the data still somewhere. So this is what we uh, should do with the data of the database. And what's the point here is that users, when, using, when, they, when they use bind mounting, they need, to, they need to know the path inside the container, where to bind bound their uh, directory. So you should consider using some paths that are common. For Postgres, it's usually this path in like regular system. So why not using it inside a container? And that uh, brings me to another tip uh, that doesn't have any example, but um, as I was speaking about the thin layers, the thin layer was actually extending the container, so users should, well, have an easy way how to do it. So just think about how, what it means to extend your container. That's it. So that's what, that was for the Postgres or general database container. Let's look what about, yeah, question? Right, so the question is what's the ownership of the files inside the container and outside the container, how to like, make it working? Uh, yeah, this, this is responsibility for the user who is running the container, so the um, data, data or the, the files have proper owner. Um, it's also connected to C Linux. They also need to have proper C Linux. It's not about uh, ownership only. And yeah, since currently, um, as till yesterday, there was no user spaces, so we need to keep the UIDs the same inside the container and outside. So this is a responsibility for the user who is running the container. Okay, uh, the Python container is one of the examples of the built containers, how we call it. Uh, so the built container, what I mean with it is that we use this container to build another application, okay? Uh, yeah, or we can use 
the term builder image. Oh, that, that's what I mean by it. Okay, um, so let's try again from the scratch, creating uh, the Docker file from the base uh, rel 7 image, create, well, installing Python uh, with Python pip. Okay. Ah, <laughs> I should probably ask before I edit. So, yeah, hopefully some of you uh, managed to spot the issue. There was no uh, young clean all in the end. So, yeah, this is, this is how we do it correctly. You, you already know why. And again, running it. And we see that the build succeeded. But we also see, and uh, maybe it can, can be uh, overlooked somehow, uh, sometimes, that Yam was having a problem with Python pip. Yeah, it's not available on the uh, RHEL 7. So, <laughs> it, it's kind of weird that Yam uh, can't install some package, but still the build uh, is successful. So please be aware of that and don't believe Yam much. Well, rather look at the log and see what is happening. Or you can use some trick that uh, we started to use in the images that we check the uh, packages installed using RPM minus V. It's also a way to go. Okay, um, so this is basically it. We, the Python itself is not uh, a microservice at, uh, it, at its uh, well, well, but it is basis. Uh, like, we can't do much with the Python, right? So we have the Python in the container, and we can be almost ready. So we can ship this to a user, and we can say, okay, this is it. Use it. And the user will ask, okay, how I get the application inside? So this, this may be one of the options. So now we are using as a base image or already our created image before, okay. We add some installation script. We run the installation script and set the command, the default command to run the application itself. So let's, let's imagine that uh, this script will install some bad guest book application, and the application will be located here, and we will set this as a uh, default command. Yeah, it, it works. Well, uh, let's see, yeah, this is, this is the script actually, and, and after we uh, build it, yeah, it, it should work. Well, it really is not anything wrong with it. What is wrong is that every user would have to do something like this. And, well, it's not that, that complicated, but we can make it better. So, let's try to be user, uh, let's try to make user to be a bit more effective. And for this purpose, there is the tool called source to image. And it was developed by OpenShift specifically for this particular case to get the source into the image and produce in the end another layer image with your application already. So this is the definition. I hope you already managed to read it, but let's rather take a look at the example. So you can install the package called source to, source to image and this uh, package includes the binary S2I. And using this command, we do pretty much the same as before using how many lines? Maybe 15, 10, I don't know. So what it does is it downloads or just copies the application on this path. It can be also the Git repository. It will use this Python 3.4 RHEL 7 image as a base and creates another container called guestbook. Now, how it works inside, because that's probably what you are wondering about right now. Uh, in the base image itself, we need to have some support for this source to image. 
And the support means to have basically two scripts only. We use bash scripts, it can be probably whatever, um, whatever language you want, but bash is totally fine here. First script, assembly, is used during creation of the layered image with the application. And second, run script is used as the main command, as the default command uh, to run the container. Let's see what the, what, how the uh, most uh, simple, uh, simplest uh, example might look like. This is the assembly script. It just copies the application, which is at this point mounted to the TMP SRC. And uh, we do also some, hmm, well, I would say clever decision uh, if there is some requirements TXT, which in Python world uh, means usually PyPy packages list. We install these requirements. The run script is also, um, well, can be much, much simpler than this, but uh, in this case, I want to show you how we can be a bit clever uh, that when there is a Django application installed, we can run the application uh, so the user doesn't have to uh, specify this manually because uh, Django applications are run in a simple or similar way, so we can do it for him. And of course, in the practical, well, in, in the end, we can support more, more frameworks. So this is another tip I would like to give you. Focus on most common frameworks and try to support them. As I was speaking about microservices, this is also something we should uh, care about in these kind of images, exposing some uh, known ports, for example, uh, 8080 for the, uh, the Django. Yeah, it's, it's quite usual port. And this is exactly because uh, we want to create microservices. One special requirement from OpenShift was that the containers should run as an arbitrary user. So let's have an example. I would run, to, uh, I, I would run the container as user 5006, for example. And it should work. And it was not that easy to do. Well, uh, but it is possible, of course. So this is how we do it. Uh, we need to change ownership of some files to some specific uh, uh, UID, and uh, especially here you can see that we set the uh, group ID to zero, which is what Docker uses if you specify the UID without group ID. So this is how you, you can uh, manage to run uh, the container with any user ID, and it works. Of course, you won't be able to use the root uh, inside, but that's not what you want. You can already work with the um, non-root user at this point. Another example how, it, uh, how the source to image works in practice with the uh, GitHub, as I already mentioned. And this is a test of you. What really matters in the container world? That's right, content. Thank, thanks. <laughs> okay, now uh, we know how to build containers, and as, as I said, we need to use good content for it. Where to get the nice bits? I already mentioned it in the in the beginning. Software collections already already deliver nice content, test it. You know, it also includes pip for rel seven or rel six. So why not use the software collections? Uh, it's, well, installing the RPMs is quite, quite easy. Software collections just use some weird names. As you see, the packages uh, have some weird prefix, but it doesn't change anything in the Docker file. And what is special about software collections is that when you want to use some, uh, for example, binary Python in particular version, you need to use this trick, SCL enable, to change the environment. And that was a, like, 
uh, this, this, this would be done in a non-container world. In container world, we are able to do something like this. We can hide the fact that the container includes the software collection. We won't be able to say which of the co containers include software collections, which not. That's quite no nice because what people are co complaining about software collections is because of this weird SEO enable stuff that must, must be done and the weird packages names. So don't be afraid to combine these two technologies. It, it's working quite, quite nice. We can have well, containers testing once. We can have multiple versions of particular image or particular package in the container as well. Well, usually you don't, you don't need it, but sometimes you might. You know, for example, the Python example, you still need to have Python 2.7 in order to use yum inside the container. So when you want to have like Python 3.5, well, software collections might be quite usable. Um, so how to make software collections enabled by default? Yeah, this was not an easy task and it's not working in 100% of cases, but only in 99%, so it's quite good. <laughs> uh, we can just, uh, yeah, this is the example how it runs, but how it is done is here. We can play a bit with bash environments. We can then unset them. Well, this is just for the reference probably. I won't speak much about it because time is, time is almost uh, done. So just if anybody else uh, would like to do, do the same, like changing the environment variables um, using some um, command, this is how we can do it. Yeah, and entry point we, we use is very, very simple, but we need it for the collections, but don't use entry point much, uh, because as I see in different uh, containers on the Docker Hub, people use container uh, entry point much, and it's, it's not good, because uh, you break. Um, well, there are reasons to, to not use it. Um, so what containers do we have right now in the Docker Hub or in the Red Hat registry. Uh, we have containers for CentOS on Docker Hub and for RHEL, Atomic, or OpenShift in the um, well, Docker Hub or the Red Hat registry. We focused on creating these containers look the same. For example, databases use similar options. And as I said, we support only specific use cases. This is a set of containers based on uh, software collections in the Red Hat registry, as, I, as you see. Um, this is, again, set of uh, images, similar set, but available for everyone on Docker Hub. And this, this is a set of uh, images based on uh, CentOS. So we can try them right now, if the internet is working here or in the afternoon. Okay, uh, and what I would really recommend when you want to build your containers on top of some another container, use the containers for a reliable provider like Red Hat or CentOS. So you will probably find it a bit difficult to find those reliable containers on the Docker Hub. So just use uh, like, um, yeah, you, you need to find a bit. And if you want to push some Docker files or the Docker images into Docker Hub, think about what the name says about the containers because you see that the name is the only thing what users see. Okay, this is not very, very important and I don't have much time about, uh, for it, so just a few, few things about how to call the containers. Not very interesting. What I call the API of the container is something what um, uh, users see from outside, for example, the paths. I already mentioned it, so just pick the paths correctly or use the paths that are supposed to be used outside the container, for example. Also, use some metadata for the containers. For example, in OpenShift, you can use uh, this metadata to be able to find the containers easily. Yeah? 
So take a note about it. And don't forget about the security. And at this point, I just recommend to use some of these links, or both of them, <laughs> ideally, to uh, Dan Walsh and uh, Marianne uh, Duffy's uh, coloring book. It's really fun. You can really coloring the book. It's not like uh, it's it's quite quite fun and a lot of things to do, uh, a lot of uh, things to learn. Okay, um, about complex applications, I realized that this was what to, um, Vasek Pavlin was talking about yesterday. So I will probably just skip it and tell you that you should, uh, if you weren't here yesterday for Vasek's presentation, you just you should probably just uh, download the uh, recording. And uh, yeah, it was about the molecular cool stuff just to uh, refresh your mind. And that brings me to, to the end. And since we are almost, not almost, we are really uh, out of time, I'm here uh, during this day, uh, the whole uh, tomorrow, talk to me about everything, what you want to know about containers, building containers for OpenShift, whatever, software collections even. Yeah, I'm here. I'm on Zahorak. You can see my email here. Thank you. Раз.
Who's the name of the presenter? Okay. All three of them. Uh, huh? anyway, like five people there. No, no, no. Uh, I'm not presenting. Oh, right. Okay, okay. So, so you get one of those? And actually, yeah. Sarah, I have a question. You may find Yes, you have 40 minutes to hold. We'll show the time with like a 10 minutes left. You can, if you have time for questions, you can go out scarf some people who make like ask good questions. So we have a second microphone. Yeah. You can you just keep that one, yeah. And we'll pass it. Yep. And just we have some spare here. Sometimes some speakers just scratch against the microphone, so I think we should just take it off. During this one, I'll go and visit the museum and yeah. start it. Okay. I can tell them to move a bit, a bit to the center so we have because the I can't go there to throw using up the size and then. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah, yesterday like, it was actually full. Now it's Where else do we still have permits that can get rid of All because it's time here, yeah. it's not that early anymore. Yeah. Yeah, uh, we have links to other directories and all sorts of stuff. So we'll do that after. Okay, thank you very much. in that directory but it doesn't that directory doesn't have any of the notes.
Okay. So please take your seats again. We will be starting in a minute.